Hello, my name is David, and it's great to welcome you to the latest D&D History Hub presentation. I love history and I know that you do too, so please give my channel a like and subscribe if you appreciate the content, it really helps. This video is the first in an occasional series on the history of England's working class. In this first one, the focus will be on the atrocious housing conditions they suffered in the early years of the Industrial Revolution. Some background on the English working class first. Now, it was once the backbone of England's economic and industrial power, but today it appears to be fading away. This began slowly, perhaps 40 years or so ago, as the UK started to transition from an industrial to a globalised services dominated economy. And it's also been claimed that the UK Labour Party, which historically uh, represented working class interests and uh, offered them support, has shifted focus, embracing such things as identity politics, uh, social justice, environmentalism, uh, wokeism, and internationalism. Uh, Maurice Glassman, the director of the Common Good Foundation and a Labour life peer, says the UK Labour Party and the left uh, more generally has lost confidence in both the working class and democracy. Labour has abandoned its own tradition and the communities that formed and nourished it, he says. And I'll provide a link below to the source of this quote, as I do for other references I make in this presentation. Working class communities have been doing it tough. For instance, a recent report found that many young white working class school kids suffer from issues such as persistent multi-generational disadvantage, a lack of social capital and disengagement from the education curriculum. Indeed, white working class kids are the least likely to go to university and they fall behind their peers at every stage of education. Historically, the working class have won many important political, industrial and socio-economic victories. But they've also suffered violence, exploitation, despair and lives damaged and cut short. So, in this first of an occasional series on the history of the English working class, I want to ask, is its past any guide to its future? So to start, let's go back to the beginning, to the Industrial Revolution, generally held to have occurred between 1750 to 1840, but those dates are just a guide. Um, much happened in industry and society, both earlier and later. Before the Industrial Revolution, most workers were employed in agriculture, either as self-employed farmers, tenants, or agricultural labourers. Families tended to make their own clothing, and many also spun and wove products for general sale. It was done mostly at home, in a hard-working environment, in which everyone pitched in. Out of this grew the textile industry, the making of cloth and clothing, eventually a, a massive massive industry. England's population had been growing over the centuries since the medieval era, rising to more than 10 million by the turn of the 18th century. This also saw a growth in cities. By 1800 there were more than 50 towns with populations of more than 10,000 and this, this was a huge increase. Commerce and industry grew but it was more or less confined in small commercial operations and workshops, not yet large factories. But that all changed during the 19th century as jobs boomed in the growing cities with their expanding factories. Now this story is not just about men. During the Industrial Revolution textile factory workers for example mostly were unmarried women and children too including lots of orphans. Typically they worked for 12 to 14 hours a day 
with only Sundays off, all for low pay and terrible conditions. The working class as a recognisable body developed between 1780 and 1830, according to the great uh, English historian and scholar E.P. Thompson. It was a time of enormous change and social disruption, in which emerged a people united by common interest and who possessed a collective self-consciousness, as Thompson puts it. He argues that class is actually a relationship of people based on common experiences, culture and interests. The Industrial Revolution had a catastrophic impact on these people. Many were subjected to an intensification of two dreadful forms of relationship, economic exploitation and political oppression. Now here's a question. Is there any relationship between the beginning or the making of the English working class and its decline now? Are they linked? Or are the times so different? There couldn't possibly be a connection. I'd be interested in your view, so let me know if you wish in the comments below. Now I want to take a quick look at something of utmost importance to the working class, and that's housing. By and large, homes were beyond atrocious. In 1844, a 22-year-old Prussian man decided to investigate the lives of the poor in northern England. Enter Friedrich Engels, the son of a wealthy businessman who happened to own a cotton textile mill in Salford near Manchester in Lancashire. Young Engels, who would uh, later team up with a certain Karl Marx, desired to discover what life was like for those at the bottom of the rung. What he found shocked and appalled him, and helped to set him on the path to a politics that would rock the world. That's right, communism. His book, The Conditions of the Working Class in England, was first published in German in Germany in 1845, and the English language edition only came out in 1887. I provide a link to the book below. You can read it yourself online for free. It's a real eye-opener. Engels examined the experience of the working classes in, a, in and around Manchester, and what he discovered, you know, just shocked and appalled him. It was horrendous. A total horror story. Every working man, he wrote, was constantly exposed to loss of work and food, to death by starvation, and many perish in this way. The dwellings of the workers are everywhere badly built, badly planned, badly ventilated, damp and unwholesome, he wrote. Many people had died of starvation under the most revolting circumstances. The English working class, says Engels, call this social murder and accuse our whole society of perpetrating this crime perpetually. Who was to blame? Well, according to Engels, it was the bourgeoisie, the middle to upper class, the mill and factory owners. He wrote, I have never seen a class so incurably debased by selfishness, so corroded within, so incapable of progress. The English bourgeoisie knows no bliss save that of rapid gain, no pain save that of losing gold. Manchester wasn't just a one-off. Many other cities were terrible, including the capital, London. Uh, I provide a link below, actually, to my video on the London slums. But slowly, decent homes gradually became more widely available for working-class people. In 1884-85, the Royal Commission on the Housing of the Working Classes investigated the situation culminating in the Housing Act of 18. 85. So, by the outbreak of World War I, about 24,000 new council houses had been built in England, and the number grew as the years passed. That Commission's report has been described as the most important and comprehensive statement on the reform of public health and housing to emerge from Parliament in the late 19th century. The Commission marked the beginning of a very important move. 
that local authorities had to build and provide adequate housing for the poor. But that's another story. I'll talk about the history of council housing in a future episode, including a fateful decision with unintended consequences by the Thatcher Conservative government in 1980, which gave 5 million tenants the right to buy their homes. That's it for now. I'll talk with you again soon. Goodbye.